Okay, I'm going to read a passage, uh, begin with a passage. I had it marked and then I closed my book. Hold on. I'm not going to tell you where it's from. Some of you will know. Well, let me give you a hint. It's from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, there you go. Before I move my hands and feet, I will bless his name. I will praise him before I go out or enter or sit or rise. And while I lie on the couch of my bed, I will bless him with the offering of that which proceeds from my lips. From the ranks of men and before I lift my hands to eat of the pleasant fruits of the earth, I will bless him for his exceedingly wonderful deeds at the beginning of fear and dread in the abode of dark distress and desolation. I will meditate on his power. I will lean on his mercies all day long. I know that judgment is of all the living is in his hand and all his deeds are truth. And I will praise him when distress is unleashed and magnify him because of salvation. I will pay no man the reward of evil, and I will pursue him with goodness. Now, I could read on, but anyone recognize where that comes from other than Dr. Charles Worth, who published it recently <laughs> in a beautiful volume? Uh, anybody? I read it the first day of class. Doug? That's from the community rule. It's from the community rule, the Yaka, the Serek. So here we come to the last day of our class on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And as I told you last class, one of the things I wanted to do in this course is not make it a course Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, which I have taught before, but just the Dead Sea Scrolls. But being a professor of Christian origins and New Testament, as is Professor Charlesworth, uh, Princeton University, one of the great Dead Sea Scroll scholars of our time. Um, we constantly think about apocalyptic messianic movements in late Second Temple Judaism, don't we? And defined broadly, we have a new covenant, prepare the way in the wilderness, mikvah or baptismal initiation group which offers as i just read you sacrifices of thanksgiving with their lips who has shares their goods in common and are expecting the coming of the messiahs and the prophet like moses and did i just describe the dead sea group or the jesus group who could tell me which one did I describe the Pharisees? I don't think so. Sadducees, no. So you get the point. Uh, before I turn it over to Dr. Charlesworth, and we can jump in and ask him questions and so forth, but he has his book I showed you last time. I won't grab it again, but Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is an edited volume I would highly recommend. In no way is it out of date. It was done years ago, but it's a wonderful volume of uh, a kind of who's who of Dead Sea Scroll studies contributing these uh, wonderful essays on Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's a tendency in our field to say, oh, no, no, don't make parallels with Jesus because, you know, that's apologetic and, you know, you're making Jesus the main thing and so forth. But, you know, you can take that tendency too far. We read Edmund Wilson's 1955 New Yorker article, remember? And there was kind of a fear going through the land that this movement's going to get too close to Christianity. It's going to be a threat because I just named a bunch of things. New covenanters preparing the way in the wilderness, quoting Isaiah 40 and saying, this is what we're all about. The kingdom's near, the judgment's near and all those other things I listed. And I think there was kind of a nervousness, like, whoa, is it like a precursor? Or did you, one of my students said, 
did Jesus copy? You know, I like that. Like a little kid says, you copied. Did Jesus copy? I mean, if somebody says, as somebody does in the Thanksgiving hymns, Violet, uh, he who dips his hand with me in the bowl has lifted up his hand against me. And then somebody also says that at a Last Supper, both quoting the psalm, same psalm. That's kind of a parallel, isn't it? Or how about strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered the night before his arrest and betrayal? Is that Jesus or the teacher? You see where I'm going. Well, they're not the same. They're at least 100 years apart, maybe more, right? We've studied that. So let me just introduce Ross Nichols. Ross, wave your hand there. Ross Nichols is the author of the Moses Scroll, which I highly recommend. It's the best overall treatment of the Shapira Scroll. And Jono Vander, also a guest. Jonah's a friend of mine and Ross. And uh, he's from Australia. And he happens to be in town visiting Ross. And he's very interested in the Dead Sea Scrolls and particularly in the Shapira Scroll, which is a Dead Sea Scroll, by the way. And Jim Charlesworth and I are two scholars, along with Shimon Gibson, who uh, believe that the Shapira Scroll needs to have uh, another look, a more careful look, because it was dismissed as a forgery when people thought, what could survive in the desert for 2,000 years? Nobody wrote on leather. Why is it wrapped in linen with sticky stuff on it? What is this thing? It must be a forgery. And we've talked about that before. So Dr. Charlesworth, Jim, my friend, were the two Jims. I'm James the Lux, by the way. We're talking about age here, right? Not greatness, no. <laughs> but Jim Charlesworth and I, let me just tell you this, and then I'm going to let him say what he wants, and you guys can jump in and ask questions. He's a teacher. He likes dialogue. Um, you know how I remember Jim the best is digging at Qumran together with Hanan Eshel and Magen Broshi, and then taking off together on our own adventures, where we went in all the caves around Qumran, including cave one, couple caves that we not discovered, but identified by Evan Bohan. I told you that last time. It's mentioned in the Copper Scroll. And then Jim and I decided, let's go to all the Herodian fortresses. Everybody goes to Masada, and some people go to the Herodium. But what about the Hyrcania that's on the way to Jericho? You see the sign. Why don't we climb Hyrcania? What about the Alexandria, you know, that's just north of Jericho? So we didn't get over to Jordan and do all the others. Uh, well, actually, I can't remember, Jim, if we were together when we did uh, Macaris or not. But out of the seven or eight fortresses, we've done about five together. And I'm not talking about, you know, a formal archaeological dig, just hiking and talking and watching the sunset in the desert. We're desert rats. And so many times at Qumran, we've sat at the end of a hard day, tired and sweaty, because it's 110 degrees sometimes in the desert in the summer when we're there. And, you know, we'll sit outside and watch the sunset and maybe sip a Maccabi beer and uh, talk about what it was like. And the thing I most remember about Jim is uh, there's that big cave above Qumran. We call it the teacher's cave. It's that big prominent one that all the tourists go, well, I want to go up there. And you can actually go up there and go in it. But uh, we pictured the teacher and we would go up there and sit. And when you watch the sunset over the community and just try to imagine the feeling, the desert gets perfectly quiet. And maybe you hear some rocks moving and you look over and it's a badger or a gazelle or a jackal. And then it begins to get dark. It is so magical. And then the temperature drops 20 degrees in about 20 minutes. And finally, it's just wonderful. It actually gets cold at night. So Jim, with that mystical introduction, because we, we love the desert, we understand why people 
went out to the Arava and prepared the way of the Lord. Tell us about these two movements that uh, we didn't know much about until the scrolls were found in, in the Jesus movement. Thank you, Jim. What a wonderful introduction. I haven't prepared anything, so it will bubble out from my memory or notes I might have on a desk. But I do want to say first, how lucky each of you are to have such an experienced professor. How many professors at Duke or at Princeton who teach Christian origins or early Judaism have really been to Qumran, have really prayed by the wailing wall, have gotten dirty, which is a technique we use for a person who digs. When I met my wife, I was covered with dirt. I had been digging, but miracles happened upon miracles. So Jim and I have spent special moments together. And we have shared so much. And I hope I can say right now that he's had some of the great students. Over 40 chairs or positions around the world, including China and Australia, are now occupied by my students. So when I think about my students, I think about how I've given my life to others. And that's what James Tabor has done. He's a man that knows how to reach others. And he's a man who knows how to love and share. And it all comes from God. And uh, we are free to reject what the church says because we have experienced God in our own way. I would say as Jesus did, but how well do we really know Jesus? With the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that was a monumental shift. It's hard to exaggerate how important the Dead Sea Scrolls are on. For example, before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, there was a man that said, Yesu var kein Yuda. Jesus was in no way a Jew. And then a man named Elias Hippo, well, Hitler, uh, took that very seriously. Hitler had a myth. Jesus was not a Jew, the Jews killed him. And if you look at Matthew, you've got a real problem. I always have a problem reading that passage and a lot of New Testament scholars say contextualize it, contextualize it. And I wanna say, how do you get people to contextualize it? In Matthew, the Jews only in Matthew say, let his blood be on us and our descendants. You see, we have a tremendous task, you, Jim, all of us, and it's to break that myth. And how do you break it? The Dead Sea Scrolls help us understand. And my first book was Jesus within Judaism. You must study Jesus, not within the church only, but first and foremost, and continuously within Judaism. It's hard for me to talk because I would go on for more than two weeks. It's been my life. Now, how have the Dead Sea Scrolls helped us understand Jesus? Well, there was a view that Jesus was a Gentile, or when I published my book on Jesus within Judaism, some of the greatest scholars in the world said, but you don't understand he was a different kind of Jew. He was a Christian. And I've urged my students never to use the word Christian for the first century, because you're going to be using terms Christians are not Jews. All the early Jews, all of them, uh, all of the early Christians were Jews. And all of the documents in our Bible were composed by Jews with one exception, and we're not sure about it. So the Bible is really a collection of Jewish writings that cover well over a thousand years. I wish the church would wake up and realize people are hungry for the truth and don't want platitudes or little stories. But that goes back to my grandfather, Reverend Dr. Thomas Charlesworth, and my grandfather, Reverend Professor Dr. Arthur Charlesworth. They fought the church 
because they belong to the church and they wanted the church to recognize you're not to entertain. Okay, now back to the Dead Sea Scrolls. They are helping us. There are over a thousand of them. I still hear people say they're about 98. Well, what about the 20, 35 I know about that no one has? Uh, they don't count those. Uh, they are slowly coming into the hands of people. And there is a cartel trying to say all of them are fakes. And um, I have said, you can't just make that claim. You have to look at them. And what makes you think they are a fake? Well, they have a text different than our Bible. Well, I said, have you read the Dead Sea Scroll that are copies of the Bible? No, I don't have to. And now you see ignorance is becoming the rule rather than wisdom. So we have every document in the Hebrew Bible with the possible exception of one, uh, but we do have seems a commentary on it. And I would like to show you basket upon basket of little fragments with one or two letters. Tell me that is not a copy of the Bible that uh, 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 we don't know what it is. Okay, now we've talked about the Bible. Now we'll talk about the scrolls. Lo and behold, we find a movement, as James Tabor said so eloquently, that shocks us. And uh, as you know, he's made it clear, the early view was it's a form, Christianity is a form of Essenism that succeeded. Now, that was rejected because it took away the dogma of the church. But in many ways, there's truth in some of it. There's truth in a lot of things that have been thrown out the back door. Now, when we look at the New Testament, we get records of Jesus. How much of it is by Jesus and how much of it is it by people who never knew him? Uh, when we study the New Testament, we've developed a way that says that is clearly Jesus and not his followers. When we look at these sayings, then we lay another criteria. Is it unique to Jesus? If it is, okay, that is very interesting. And we find some of those are in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Then we ask, um, uh, was it a thought that was well known? And if it is, okay, then the Dead Sea Scroll idea may have been known to Jesus. And finally, can you trace the tradition back to Jesus? and back to the Essenes. Uh, let me give you an example. We start with the negative. There are people saying Jesus was an Essene. They missed the whole complexity. Uh, he probably was influenced negatively and positively. Now you say, oh, come on, he never went to Qumran. Thank you, that is what critics said. They don't know the Essenes lived in Jerusalem. We know they probably lived in Migdal. They're all over the land. How do we know that? Well, we're finding evidence as we dig archeologically. Uh, James Tabor and Shimon Gibson has found a cup that has a saying and an inscription that we know was at Qumran. So I am absolutely convinced. I'll tell you very quickly my conclusion and it will come back. In 66, the Romans attack, and they eventually destroy Qumran, and they move up and burn Jerusalem. They destroy Qumran about 67, and they destroy Jerusalem in 70. So there are at least three years that Essenes could have fled. They fled in all directions. I have a long lecture about how we know they fled to China or to the east because of the Silk Road we can find Essene terms. And the best explanation is, this could be some of the Essenes who are fleeing, fleeing to the East. Here's where I would put a warning. People, because they follow Paul, say Christianity went to the West. But if you go and live in India, they'll say, oh, more, po, more so Christianity went to Odessa and then down to India and then off to China. Uh, so there are many movements and we know we have Tove says to me, all of the documents at, in the synagogue are Essene. I know some of them are clearly Essene, and the only way they got there is the Essenes fled southward. Well, what would you do, flee northward? 
here come the Roman troops. Now remember, we're talking about a massive army, 60,000 men, highly trained to kill, gladiators. And the Jews never had an army. That's another story. Um, so from 67, Essenes are fleeing in all direction and the vast majority fled to Jerusalem. For three years, they lived in Jerusalem and they joined others that I know from my own research had dwindled back to Jerusalem. Uh, we know that from Josephus, uh, that Herod was so pro-Essene. Guess what? The Essenes and the followers of Jesus, I call it the PJM movement, the Palestinian Jesus movement. It's not a church. It's a form of Judaism, and they live in exactly the same area. Now, don't tell me that you know sociology, and there's no way a group that is close to another group could influence it. It's just the opposite. If they're, if they're living closely together, they would influence. Now, why would the followers of Jesus influence an Essene? The Essenes are heartbroken. They saw their community go up in error. And many of them were believing in the coming of a Messiah. Lo and behold, right by them is another group of Jews, passionate, full of excitement. The Messiah has come. He's died for us and he's returning. He's returning. And now that's a big problem. We'll look at maybe 20 years from now. Uh, the real problem of the early Christians waiting and waiting. Luke did solve it, supposedly. All right. So, uh, I am going to tell you several places and then we can discuss it. I am not going to be a scholar. Well, you have heard it said, and uh, I would think you that it could be, but we can't be sure. Uh, I'm going to talk straight from my heart. I have no doubt that Jesus was influenced by the Dead Sea Scrolls. My first passage is uh, a, a kind of statement by D G Jesus. You'll find it in Matthew 12, 11. He says, what man of you, if he has one sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? I talked to Jews about it and they said, what, what a stupid statement. I said, you know, it may not be a stupid statement if there is a Jewish group that says you can't do anything on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. What? The Jews tell me in Jerusalem and throughout the world, there is no idea. There is no idea like that anywhere in Judaism. I said, could I read to you from the Damascus document? Uh, it's not in rabbinics. You got that right. It, there are a lot of writings, over a thousand, that contain images and ideas we didn't know Jews knew. We know Jesus knew this idea, the Sabbath, is not just for the animals. It's not just for God, it's for all. And uh, what one of you would have a dog fall into a well and not help it out. You would say, well, I don't want that religion. Listen to this. This is in the Damascus document. Let no man deliver the young of an animal in the Sabbath day. And if it falls into a pit, let him not raise it on the Sabbath. My gosh, that is clearly Jesus is referring to it. There he is. He's in Galilee and he's quiet on Shabbat, Sabbath, and he's trying to pray and meditate. And he hears the goat and it's dying. It's dying. It's, it's in a well. And Jesus says, how can I pray? How can I contemplate if someone is letting it? And he says, what is that? And I don't know which disciple, or may have been a woman, maybe Mary Magdalene said, Jesus, that's the Essene quarter, and they will do nothing. In fact, we have evidence they will not even help a man out of a pit. That is a work. Well, that's not God's will. And Jesus represents it. Did Jesus know this? Yes. Did he speak against it? Yes. And it's only in Matthew, and I'm just very curious, Matthew becomes a very fascinating book uh, of literature. Now, I want to read another passage. 
I have it here for us. Even the hairs of your head are numbered. That means it's a passive. That if you find a passive without an active subject, you know it's God. So, but even the hairs of your head are numbered by God. Okay, that's kind of odd. But guess what? In the Damascus document, the same document, we read, and the priest shall order and they will shave the head, but the skull that shall not shave, that is in order that the priest may count the dead and living hair. That is astounding. Does Jesus know this tradition that priests would count the hairs of a head to find out why someone was sick? Not a recommendation for uh, the sicknesses we have in the world today. So I think Jesus knew that one. Now that's just negatively. If we look at it positively, Jesus says, become sons of light. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where did he get that term? It was developed by the Essenes, Beni Or. There are two types of humans, the Beni Or and the Beni Hoshek the sons of light and the sons of darkness. That was the core teaching at Qumran. Uh, so Jesus said, be sons of light. Well, here I can't be certain because I know that maybe here and there you'll find something, but then I read the, the phrase sons of light, but I'm suspicious. Maybe that's also as an influence. He praises celibacy. Uh, the only celibate group, that's Matthew 19, 12, the only celibate group are the Essenes. Now, how could they do that? The first commandment, you think you have it, be fruitful and multiply. That's the first commandment. How can you break the first commandment? If all the Jews stop having children, you know, wow. Uh, so you do have uh, that issue and no divorce in Matthew. We can go on and on, but there is a consensus today that you cannot ignore the Dead Sea Scrolls if you really want to understand Jesus. Now, there are the positivists. Well, you know that. Yeah, the negativists, it can't be. The earth can't be flat. The positivists, uh, the world is round because I would fall off of it. You know, all these kind of claims. We don't work with positivism or negativism we work with probability. Uh, when I taught at Duke and spoke to a thousand freshmen and their parents, I said, you send your child here so they will have their questions answered. As a professor, I teach them to ask questions so that when they graduate, they'll know how to answer questions and have far more questions than they can ever answer. And I think that's the role of a great teacher. And I know that's what James would agree to. We're not giving you answers. We do have same answers. Jesus was influenced by the Essene, but he was not an Essene. Um, so there are some thoughts. Um, I'm finishing a biography of Jesus. In fact, it's finished. And uh, I hope each of you can buy one. Where I'm trying to, I just got a gift of $50,000 to pay for the photographs in it. So uh, uh, let's, let's hope that my lifelong search for Jesus and my answers and my attachment to him uh, is, is shared and people can say, well, that's what he thinks. That's very nice. Now, what do you think? Dr. Tabor, you're muted, I think. There you go. Um, 
Can you tell us something, Jim, about the uh, your new edition of the Hodayot, the Thanksgiving hymns that you've worked on? How will it, we have Vermish, we have Martinez, we have Wise, Abeg, and Cook, you know, these translations, but Martinez gives us a critical text. And now you're bringing out with more in this more Seebeck German publisher, this beautiful volumes. I got the community rule. How will your edition of the Thanksgiving hymns differ from what we already have? What, what did you do differently? Um, it took 50 years of work. I started it when I was a student at Duke working with Strugnell. And uh, we had Doran Mendels, the brilliant mind, chairman of the history department at Hebrew University, Jerusalem. And Lauren Stucken, not, not Lauren Stucken, but Hermann Lichtenberger, who is the top professor at Tubingen. They worked on it for 20 years and I took it over. And in the last 15 years working with Leah, for the first time, every fragment is read. The columns are in the right order and it is at the publisher now and it will be in your hands in September. Uh, it is the jewel among the Dead Sea Scrolls, as many scholars have said. Uh, it is full of brilliance. Uh, in the early days, some scholars thought the whole thing was written by the Mori Hasidic, the anonymous righteous teacher. And anonymity is part of Qumran, which is another discussion. Uh, and I can find that appearing in some documents. And I'm wondering if that is an influence from Qumran. Uh, some of the poems were clearly composed by the righteous teacher, but uh, many could have been and then were edited over years. And then you have others. He was not the only brilliant man. These were the sons of Aaron, which takes the tradition all the way back uh, to, to Moses and through uh, David and especially Solomon. Uh, it's a great tradition. And uh, the Hodiot, I have passages that we can look at, but it's a work of genius. Mm. Um, Violet, uh, I'm going to go back to gallery view here. You just did your MA thesis on hearing the voice of the teacher in the Odeyot. What, and we have studied it in this class. We, we read it rather carefully. Um, what are some of the passages that you would consider most obviously, if you can think off the top of your head, some of the phrasing? Am I putting you on the spot too much? Yeah. I mentioned <laughs> one about uh, members of the community turning against me and members of my own council dipping their hand and raising up the heel, which is, of course, the same illusion we had in the Gospels, you know, on the night Jesus was betrayed. But what, what are some of the things that convinced you that you're actually hearing the voice of the teacher? And before you, while you're thinking, I'm giving you time to think here, um, think of how significant it is to have first person testimony from the ancient world. I'm not talking about the letters of Cicero or something, you know, Marcus Aurelius meditations. No doubt those do come to us, but think about our Hebrew Jewish literature. The gospels, were not composed as far as most scholars are concerned by, you know, necessarily Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but are an uh, amalgamation of traditions, not by a single person. Uh, now Luke Acts does claim to be by a single person, but he's relying on secondary accounts. You know, he says, I check with eyewitnesses. So he's not an eyewitness. So I think of the seven letters of Paul, of course, you know, he's writing, I, 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 I've seen the Lord. I've done this. I've done that. I went up to Jerusalem. I saw James. There's a movement um, today 
on the internet primarily is where it dwells on YouTube called the, they call themselves mythers. They don't believe Jesus even existed. Now, most of us would laugh that off and say, well, that's ridiculous. But they have quite a set of arguments. But one of the things that they really have trouble answering is why Paul, writing in the first person, would say, I went up to see James and Cephas or Peter, and I stayed in Jerusalem for two weeks. You know, it, it's like a first person thing. You read Enoch, I don't think Enoch wrote Enoch. I don't think when I read, you know, there's several sections of Enoch, but just take the beginning, opening 1 through 72. I don't think that's the guy Enoch in the Bible, you know, the seventh from Adam. Um, but what if in the Dead Sea Scrolls, unlike the community rule of Damascus document, we have a personality See, when you get first-person material, you can actually analyze what the person's like. And this particular figure, uh, Violet's thesis is called hearing the voice of the teacher in the Horeo, hearing that voice. Um, I believe in all of my years of studying the historical Jesus, and some of you had my Jesus class, I think in some of the Q material, we can actually hear the voice of Jesus of Nazareth. You know, I don't think all of the sayings attributed to Jesus are his voice. Now, how would I know that? Uh, some of the things that uh, Charles Worth just quoted, you know, which of you having an animal falling into a pit and so forth. It's got a kind of a ring of truth. It's somewhat subjective. But the Hodayot, especially columns 10 through 17, which I know you worked on, Violet, yeah. they in particular begin, you can't see his face, you don't know his name, but if you will read those, even in English, you actually begin to feel like you know this person. And I think it's as dramatic as uh, picking up a bit on Jesus and the Gospels. I think the Gospels are much more of a filter. You follow? In other words, you're getting to Jesus, but there's layers that may or may not be Jesus, interpretations and so forth. You can see that easily by seeing how Mark will write something and Matthew will redact it and re-edit it and Luke will further edit it. You know, where, what happened to Jesus? But in the Hodayot, we just have the, the primarily the one version from Cave One. So Violet, what can you tell us a few of the things since you spent five years working on this? Am I embarrassing you or putting you on the spot? What are some of the, some of the things that you think really, you're hearing a, a human being that once lived, an actual person with a name and address, not just the a main, religious idea. Go ahead. The main thing is throughout those hymns, I, I heard the suffering of this person and I specifically spoke to you about column 11, and it was Dr. Charlesworth's um, translation, the suffering. And I, I would have never thought that they would consider cutting someone's tongue off and breaking their arm to silence them. I mean, it just shocked me, but I could read it throughout the hymns. He was, this figure was brilliant. He was brilliant. He knew every kind of literary strategy. He knew every, every scripture. I mean, because in the scrolls, they don't just take a whole passage. They splice passages. I mean, it just can have just multiple meanings. I mean, it's just the most fascinating thing I think I've ever worked on. Hmm. Well, you must continue your search. Oh, I can too. <laughs> there you go. Uh, you sh are you thinking about maybe going on and getting a PhD? Well, I would like to, but I'm kind of getting a little bit older. <laughs> so, but yes, uh, I've been encouraged and I've been encouraged to go ahead and publish a book based on what I'm working on. Hmm. But yes, me and Dr. Tabor spoke and there's just so many similarities between, between Jesus and the teacher of righteousness. And you just can't, I mean, it's just hard to overlook. Well, let me say something that is in the vein of what you're saying. There are a lot of people in Charlotte that would say, 
uh, you are a heretic. Jesus, I've already heard it. <laughs> Jesus is unique. Well, that's heretical. Yeah. Jesus is fully human and fully divine. Now that we all confess as Christians, we yeah. may mean it in so many different ways. But if we cut the umbilical cord to humanity, we have cut the most important aspect of Christianity, that God so loved the world that he sent a fleshly male into the world. If you call him the son, what does that mean? You know, you, now you're immediate, immediately in Greek thought about Zeus and stuff like that. That's does, that is not what it means. It is a fleshly human being. One reason I like the Gospel of John is people say it is a very divine book and it presents Jesus as eternal and he doesn't suffer. And I said, well, you've never read John. They said, oh, yeah, I, I've read it a hundred times. I said, don't you remember that Jesus collapses? He's so tired and he's so thirsty. He says to his disciples, you go into the village. While he sits there, a woman comes out and she has a bucket or some means of getting the water. Jesus said, I'm dead tired. Would you please give me some water to drink? This is a human being. This is in the Gospel of John. Well, we jump later on and Jesus doesn't get to the tomb of Lazarus, but he cries. Well, by definition, God doesn't go around crying. So here is a human being and what I have to say is that people don't know Greek. Kai ho logos sark. And the word flesh. Everybody translates it and the word became flesh. That is not what the author wrote. He wrote in our kai ho logos and the logos sark. Egenito. And the word flesh became. There is nothing to separate word and flesh. It is fully logos and fully flesh. And you will say to me, that's not logical. Thank you. We're not interested in logic. We're interested in truth. If you want to study life by logic, you'll never understand love. You'll never understand birth. You'll never understand holding a baby. The first baby uh, that I had, I thought she had died. And I was praying for my wife. And the baby would not cry. And fortunately, the woman in charge had been there for 35 years. And it was the last week. And she knew exactly what to do. And the baby began to cry. So there was eternity there when I began to realize, what is the relationship between birth and death? They're all miracles. Thank you, Jim. Um, we've only got 15 minutes left. Would you tell us something, James, or Jim Charlesworth, I call you Dr. Charlesworth, about the reason Shapira scroll uh, that came to light in 1883, but was of course discovered in the 1860s by the Bedouin in a cave at Wadi Mujib. Why was that? Uh, I mentioned a few things opening, but what what is you're one of probably ten scholars on earth that work on uh, biblical text Dead Sea Scrolls that don't say Shapira the forger, like that's a name for him now. I was talking to Michael Stone, and you know we love Michael Stone, and I told him about Ross Nichols' book. We we're having lunch, and he goes, "Shapira, you mean Shapira the forger?" He, to him, it was just like water. You mean Shapira the forger, that Shapira? And I said, well, actually, I do mean that Shapira, but I'm not sure we should call him the forger. And he goes, oh, no, that was proven long ago. And Michael is one of the great textual scholars, but he doesn't, he hasn't looked at it. I didn't look at it. I didn't look at it till Shimon Gibson told me on a flight uh, back from a conference, and I don't even know how it came up. You know, we were sitting together on a flight, flying back from Rami Arav's Basida conference that you've been to many times because you've dug at Basida. And somehow Shapira came up and 
Shimon says, well, you know, Joan Taylor and I think that it probably was misjudged. You know, she's been working on Allegro's Nachlas. And he said, uh, we think it should be looked at again. We might have an authentic Dead Sea Scroll, maybe even from earlier than the Herodian period. So, you know, possibly. But what is your take from what you know of the Shapiro scroll? Well, I like what you're saying. Let's not get into the idea it's a fake or it's true, but we need to look at it and make a careful examination. Yes. Obviously, it was brought to the attention of people when they were completely ignorant that in the fourth century and in the ninth century, scrolls were found near Jericho. Uh, I think that is probably K4 because when the Bedouin got there, uh, there were only fragments, but I'm not sure that's true. Uh, uh, maybe there were scrolls in K4 because K4 is two caves, K4 and five, and my teacher DeVoe called them K4 because the fragments were coming in boxes and they were just saying, well, we we're finding them in the K4. caves. Mm -hmm. So it, he called it K4, but it's four and five. Now, when we realize that, well, first of all, when Shapira comes, no one imagines that leather can last so long. In fact, in, in the in in the 40s, the Yale, they were arguing, no scrolls will ever be found in Jerusalem or anywhere in the Holy Land because it's too wet. They'll only be found in Egypt. Well, they didn't know there was a place down by the Dead Sea that where you don't have rain or, or a lot of rain, or a lot of water, but caves that keep the rain away. You and I have been at Qumran when it rained. So you do get rain there, but it's a desert. And uh, so we now have proof that scrolls can be preserved for 2,000 years and more. Some of these scrolls were there for 2,400 years. That's our dating. Okay, so you have the ignorance and you have Shapir who is clearly a forger. If you go, I don't know if I've shown you in the uh, uh, American colony on the second floor, there are his uh, Shapira's forgeries. Well, it, one thousandth of a second, knowing your eye, you can say this is a forgery. Well, he did forge. So he had a reputation of being a forger. And when he says, look at the scroll, it's very valuable. Uh, who's going to believe him? Claremont Ganu was the first one to declare it is a fake. And all the criteria he used could be used with any Qumran fragment today it's in leather, it can't be preserved. We know leather can be preserved. It's not like what we have, it's different. Well, that's the beauty of the Dead Sea Scrolls. We're getting things that are a little different and challenging. Uh, actually, I would have to say that no one has published all the Dead Sea Scrolls. And when I pass, there'll still be a few fragments and some important things that haven't been published. And how long does it take someone, I started, the Dead Sea Scroll Project in Princeton in 1984. That's a long time. And I have five volumes finished, but it, it takes so long to get it through the press. When I send an ordinary book, The Beloved Disciple, I sent it in September. It was at the SBL in November. That broke a record. When I finish a book, it goes to my assistants. Then they go to computers. And three years later, we have the final checking of things and it goes to the publisher that takes a year and i get so frustrated it takes too long and uh i i want all look i finished the thanksgiving hymns i finished the testaments of the 12 patriarchs we can prove clearly that uh some of them began at qumran or in early judaism uh and uh <laughs> obviously we can see additions by christians so that's those are all finished but you don't have them. What was so the what is the Shapiro scroll? You live through okay, go ahead. I had another no, question about that. Yeah. I, I think I've I, I don't think that I can say I know as much about the Shapiro scroll as you do. I want to see it. Mm -hmm. Have we been able to find it? Have we got photographs? No. 
but we have <clears throat> transcriptions uh, that uh, yeah. Ross Nichols' book, for example, and also yeah, and I read those. Yeah, yeah, has and took kudos a, to him. Put out some good transcriptions. Yeah. Let me ask you this, uh, because you lived through it, you know all the principal players. Why were the scrolls only finally released with all the pressure of Herschel Shanks and Eisenman and others to get the photographs from the Bechtels and all of that during the 90s? But what was going on from, let's just say, 1955? to 1990 that when you were going to grad school and when you were beginning teaching, you didn't have all the scrolls. Uh, why, why was the team, even before Strugnell, why were they holding them back? Why weren't, the, you knew DeVoe. Why didn't they at least put out like 4Q521 that has the Messiah raising the dead? Now you can read that in one minute. Uh, Doug's here, he reads Hebrew. Doug could read 4Q521 right off the page, Herodian script, no problem. And it says the Messiah rules heaven and earth and he's gonna heal the sick and raise the dead and preach good news to the poor. And Puesh had it, and I don't wanna just slam Puesh, but he had it for, I think Starkey had it first, then it went to Puesh. Was there? this sense that that's too close to Jesus and therefore we're going to find a way to bring it out later or something. I mean, what was going on with a text like that? I mean, that's the most, uh, the son of God text that I think is the antichrist. And I don't know what you think. I don't think it's, I think it's the bad guy, not the good guy. Uh, I agree with uh, um, who was it that originally proposed that I can't remember now. Um, anyway, can you answer why, if we got all of the scrolls released in the 50s, you know, all that we had, and then we have 40%, Well, what was I going you, on? I want you to know the question may be simple. The answer is not. Okay. There are so many answers. Uh, first of all, some of them couldn't be read, and there was no photography. That There wasn't infrared, and that is the case. Then secondly, uh, it was DeVoe and he died too early. He was the uh, editor. And then you got the wars and no Jew could enter where the Dead Sea Scrolls were being collected. At the and then you have a problem. To whom do they belong? Do they belong to Jordan or to the Rockefeller? And to who does the Rockefeller begin? Rockefeller gave enough money, he thought, to publish the scrolls. But he never realized that if you have a scroll, you and I can get a scroll and we can publish it in less than a year, if we can read it and if it is uh, uh, together. But if it's in a 10,000 pieces, let me make a point. Some of the fragments I edited have 110 pieces. Now you have to bring them together. They're scattered on the floor. They've been there for 2,000 years. Some of them have been stepped on by the Romans. Others have been eaten by ro rats. Now you're getting into more and more problems. But remember the Maldabon Gate, no Jew could go into the area where the Dead Sea Scrolls were. And it gets more and more complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, I know this intimately because I was there. Uh, and I was involved with the Ecole. They're wonderful people, they're brilliant scholars, um, but they were under tremendous uh, pressure uh, by the world and by the war going on. Uh, I know that the tradition is that they took, the Israeli soldiers took DeVoe and had him stand on a hill and they told the Palestinians uh, that the next shot would go in his back. Now, I heard that at the Akol, I think I want to deny it. I can't believe it, believe it. Because when I've talked to Lizzie Nazir, who was the head of the uh, orphanage for girls that were being raped during the big wars, the 48 war, the 67 war, uh, I asked her who raped these pure little girls, 10, 12 years of age. She said, not one Jew. 
So uh, I want to laud the Jews. Uh, they've been very careful. Uh, love people. Uh, lots of people love to throw stones, but uh, you know John seven fifty three through eleven should never be forgotten. The one without a sin, uh, you know, uh, throw the stone. Uh, we could talk about this for decades, Jim. So it's complicated with politics, uh, personality. Well, you even have, it's war. unfortunately turned over to a very brilliant man. I don't want to mention his name. And uh, uh, I saw him smoking a cigarette and blowing the smoke into a fragment. Hmm. I saw him touch scrolls. You don't touch a scroll you begin to increase the decay. I've seen another person pick up a scroll we were photographing in the Shrine of the Book and put it up on the glass to see if he could read it better. And when he left, we gathered up the little pieces that had fallen on the floor. So, uh, and, and I, I was going to say also, some of them had trouble with alcohol and that could be related you know, you don't have money, you don't have a job, it's taking too long. Uh, and over there, you know, a lot of people drink because of the tension. So I'm not going to blame anybody, be but too many people uh, couldn't say no. How's that sound? <laughs> they drank too much. So human frailty, politics, war, all kinds of things. And lack of photographs. Yeah. Well, yeah. one thing that I've said to the students here several times, I think we started with this, is everybody wants all the scrolls. And that was huge in the 90s, right? We need the scrolls. We need the scrolls. And yet, all of the major ideas about the Yakad, its beliefs, its organization, its history, the teacher, with the Damascus document from Cairo, the Geniza, the Karait Synagogue, and the just the scrolls from uh, Cave One. You've already got uh, a huge uh, handle on the movement, answering many. In other words, you would have the Thanksgiving hymns, the war scroll, the community rule, and the Habakkuk Pesher. Uh, just with those, you are really in pretty good shape to begin talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls. So yes, I'm glad because I, I was the first one to publish 4Q521 with Michael Wise in, in your journal, as you know, the journal is Pseudepigrapha. But uh, it, I mean, I think it's an amazing text and it's very helpful to have. But I guess my point is that what I already had before that was also very noteworthy. And I can say that Violet wrote her thesis, this very fine thesis on this voice of the teacher without really using many of the scrolls uh, from the, the subsequent caves because there was enough in the Habakkuk picture in the Damascus document, you know, to document much. Not that K4 didn't add much, but it did. By the way, you all on K4, uh, you know, that's the big one that you see when you stand and look over Wadi Qumran. Um, there are seven marls, not just two, okay, four and five. And uh, we have reason to believe from radar ground scans that Eisenman did in the 90s, that one of those also has a significant cavity in it. But so far, you'd think maybe just a camera probe would be allowed, but the it's the political thing again. Who's going to authorize that? Is it the Jordanians? Is it, is it the Palestinians? Is it the Israelis? When you come from Jericho, and when you leave Jerusalem, you cross into the disputed territory, and then you go down past Qumran. That was Jordan, you see, before 48. I think most of you know that. So there's even the question by law who who owns the scrolls legally you know in terms of territory so 
Well, we're going to end now because I need 15 minutes to tell you something about your final exam and just say goodbye to you. But James, thank you for joining us and uh, Google Charlesworth. Uh, look at look at his fest rift that I contributed to. Uh, lots of articles there. His bibliography is is so extensive that uh, requires. Uh, <laughs> I think when I printed it out the other day, it was running about 50 pages. So it depends, depends on the font that you use. So take care, Jim. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you.